you're so excellent with illustrations and metaphor and story. And one of the other things that you talk about are these money levers, these three money levers that everyone needs to know about. Can you say more regarding that? Yeah, so here in Arlington, Texas, one of my favorite roller coasters is called the Titan Roller Coaster. It's got this steep incline and then this huge drop. And as I did some more research, I realized that roller coasters, like other amusement park rides, really have levers that sort of operate them. And, and you wonder, you know, here's a, a young kid controlling this big, massive machinery. But it got me thinking how in our minds, there's really just a few different levers that if we press them the right way in the right order, we can get some pretty big results. And the first one is save more. I, well, I call, I'll just read them off here. Save more, crush your debt, and earn more. And what happened was, this was back in 2009, is I would track my net worth. And I, I think of my net worth page like a report card for adults. It, you know, we no longer lose the citizenship grades and the grade in PE and lunch, which I tend to fail those as well. But it's all about how are you doing with your money? And it doesn't lie. It simply tells you, here's how much I owe minus what I, uh, or what I own minus what I owe. And here's the number. It's very straightforward. And this one year, my net worth really jumped off the page, and I tracked it back to three different things. One was, instead of just saving money, which is a great thing to do, you know, I think about saving like those medieval castles back in the day. They'd have a moat that would sort of help protect them from the marauders of the day. Anybody who was attacked had to sludge through the water around the castle to get to the castle. And so cash reserves are like that. They protect you. They provide in case of emergencies. The problem, though, is... So many people think that saving by itself is the key. And what I find is you need to be a savvy saver. And what that means is you want to have enough money, maybe six months worth of committed living expenses for those things that may come up. The air conditioner goes out, you need to get the car fixed, a surprise bill. But then the other dollars, let's still keep it fairly liquid, but let's invest those dollars in places where consumers are spending money. I call this the focus group principle, and that is I'll often ask my kids, hey, what are the products and services that you enjoy using most right now? And they'll say, man, I love my shoes, or I love this brand, or my phone. And my guess is that if they like that brand, a million plus other kids like the same brands as well, that's probably a good place to, to dribble some money into, because we know where consumers go, stocks tend to follow pretty closely. So my point there is don't just sock it all into checking or savings because you're going to have money, but it's not going to be working as hard for you as you worked for it. Now, the next thing is called crush your debt. And I want to tell you a quick story. When I launched my podcast, and by the way, this is why I respect your podcast so much because you've got so many reviews, so many listeners. It takes a lot to build a successful podcast. So my hat goes off to both of you ladies. And what I wanted to do was the World Series was coming to Arlington. This was about a year and a half ago, and it was the first time to have a neutral site because of COVID regulations and so forth. So I bought tickets for myself, my daughter, and her boyfriend, but then I realized, okay, Derek, I need to make a goal with myself, and that is I need to get a certain number of listeners to my podcast, and if I don't do that, I can't go to the World Series. And these tickets were not cheap. And so suddenly, high for you, Derek. the stakes were super high. And what I realized was, you know, man, I don't want to get emotional here, but there, there's moments in my life where when you have to put your back against the wall and you have to lean in and you have to make it happen, you find a way to make it happen. All the nervousness, all the worry, anything holding you back. It's sort of like if my son needed an emergency operation, man, I would, I would do everything possible to make that happen. I mean, you know that as, 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 as listeners and parents listening right now. And so that was my, my have to. And so the day before the World Series, we hit our goal. I mean, I was singularly focused for about two weeks. Game was on. We got to make this thing happen. And so I would encourage people to take their debt as seriously as that. And there's a couple ways to do this. One, one of my favorite methods is called the capture and keep method. So let's say that you have a commoditized expense. It's your homeowner's insurance, automobile insurance. Here in Texas, we can choose our electricity provider. I mean, whatever expenses you, you have that other companies provide almost the same one, but it's just a cost difference, call them up and let them know, look, 
I'm considering changing providers. Is there any type of a new customer discount or any kind of a discount you can give me to keep my business? 90% of the time, they always come back with, you know what, there is a way we found to save you 25 bucks, 50 bucks, $100 a month, whatever it may be. Now, what most people do is they've taken the effort to get the savings, but they typically then redirect it to something else they want. And suddenly the new truck appears in the driveway, the new computer, the new phone, we've all done it. But now we want to keep the money and put it toward your number one financial pain point, which in my case was at the time paying down my house, okay? I had a good interest rate, 2.75%. It was, I fought hard for it, but I took that savings and without having to think about it every month, put that toward my mortgage payment, ended up paying it off about eight years early, all because I didn't want to spend the money without me knowing it. The decision, just like we talked about being the CEO of your dollars, the money automatically went to that pain point without me having to think about, boy, do I buy something fun, go out tonight with my wife, or put it toward the goal that I had. And then the last one is earn more money. Excuse me. Many people listening right now are facing a job where they've got a fixed salary. But one thing the great resignation has taught us is everybody is a free agent. And that's how employers should really think about their team right now because they're getting job offers all the time. In some cases, 10, 20, $30,000 more to jump ship. The caution I would give your listeners though is be very careful about taking the cash and forgetting the culture. You know, think about what you like about your job. And if you like being there, if you like your boss, your team, then I wanna give you a strategy here. And that is don't just bang on your boss's door and demand the raise. You might get it because they realize how much it would take to replace you and so forth. You wanna ask yourself three questions. How can I increase sales in my company right now? How can I reduce costs? And how can I help grow the business? Whether you are the secretary, the administrative assistant, you're in sales, you're a mid-level manager, you're the VP of the company, the bottom line is when you can add value to the company, value comes back to you in the form of making more money. And a quick story I'll tell you about Debbie. So Debbie came in the office uh, several years ago and she was feeling frustrated. She had joined a startup firm, was excited and so forth. But a year and a half later, she felt overlooked, uh, uh, underappreciated and not listened to. She said, Derek, I really want to change jobs. But I told her, I said, before you do that, let's see if we can play a game here and try to find a way for you to make more money because she liked the culture where she was at. So she was an administrative assistant supporting uh, the CEO of the company. And the CEO was the person who took care of all the sales for all the clients and felt very overwhelmed. So we came up with a strategy to talk to the CEO about it. We said, look, why don't you take the bottom quarter of your clients and give them to Debbie. She would get licensed to be able to serve them. That would give you 25% more capacity to help grow the business. And it would let Debbie then have an opportunity to grow the relationships with these clients and make more money. Her boss was so impressed with this, it gave her a $5,000 raise just for the initiative. And she negotiated a percentage of increase in whatever she got from those new clients. And then she went further to say, you know, there's only two salespeople in the company and she pitched the CEO on, what if you empowered the entire company that if they refer a sales lead to the sales team, their results in business, then you give that employee who gave the referral a bonus. Well, suddenly now the CEO had a sales force of about 50 people because they all had a vested interest in being successful. So what that lesson is, is you can bang on the boss's door, demand the raise because my expenses have gone up. It costs more to send my kid to private school. They don't really care. They don't care about your expenses. They care about the business expenses and growing the business. And if you can tune into this favorite radio station, WIIFM, which is what's in it for me, it's your boss's favorite radio station, and listen to it loudly, you can then appeal to what's going to help them make more money, and you're almost guaranteed to make more money, and better yet, feel more appreciated doing it. And Debbie, well done, Debbie. Let's all be Debbie. Debbie. Debbie was a rock star. I mean, Debbie and, and, and Dave, we, we're collecting them all today. And De you know, here Debbie comes into the office, and she was down. You know, she was like, Derek, I want to update my resume. 
But what, what I find, and it's proving itself out years later, people are jumping ship right now for jobs and may pay them double their salary, 25% more because people are wanting to get that talent, but they get there and they realize, man, the culture here sucks. I don't even like working here. Now I'm grappling with, I make more money. Can I go back to my old job? So I would just assess where your feet are right now. That's where the opportunity may be the biggest for you today. Yeah, we do love job hopping and we talk about it all the time. I love you calling it a free agent because that is a perfect way to look at it. Um, but yeah, you do have to look at company culture and even benefits and there's not, it's not either or it's either I, you know, I stay and I don't get raises or I leave and I get that uh, percentage raise that I'm looking for. There's always a third option and it's always, we're always trying to look for the third option when it, when it comes to frugality too, because we feel like frugality is the true third option. Um, and it's just like that with making money too. We always think in, well, I can do this or I can do that. And those are my choices, but there's always a third, fourth, fifth option. Yes. Um, and I love how you, you know, promote the creativity to try to find that third option. It's not the most convenient, but it's not the most inconvenient. It's just, it's, it's just another way. You just have to think a little bit harder for a little bit longer to get those creative juices flowing and think of maybe something that you don't think is possible but you never know if it's possible unless you try it, unless you pitch it. Um, and I just, I, I love that. And I hope, <laughs> I think there are going to be a ton of people that go back and listen to this episode twice because there's like just so, so, so much good stuff in it. Well, Jen, I'll, I'll tell you a story to kind of piggyback on that. I mentioned the roller coaster a few minutes ago. And one of the desires I had was I wanted to be able to hold my hands up on the roller coaster the entire ride. So going up this big incline, there's about three seconds that was holding me back and just gripping me with fear. And what I began to realize was, and this is going to sound a little bit morbid, but I want to just let you through my thoughts. I began to realize, okay, first of all, I'm buckled in really securely. And when you're leaning down, like I said, there's a moment you feel like you're going to fall out, but I realized I'm buckled in, there's a harness. And I realized even if I did fall out, I would actually die pretty quickly. And, and so there wouldn't be a whole lot of issue there. But I realized the odds of me dying and slipping out are so low, it's worth the risk. And so what I did is I just recognized, okay, the next three seconds when I go up this thing, I made the decision at the bottom and not at the top. Because at the top is where the fear is the highest, at the bottom fear is the lowest. And I held my hands up. And, and at this point, my son was there, his buddies were there. And I was like, I told them, okay, I'm going to keep my hands up. Now there's some accountability and I don't want to be the weenie adult on the ride who, who, you know, who doesn't crush it like they say they're going to do. And going down, I was like, oh my gosh, after three seconds. And then I held my hands up the rest of the ride. I held my hands up on almost all the roller coasters that day because I had to go into this ugly fear that I had to face that sounds so mild, but it was three seconds of horror for me. And I came out feeling so much better. And I say all that because there may be something holding you back right now. You know, many people may think, Derek, it would take a lot of courage for me to approach my boss about making more money. Well, here's what I would tell you. The guaranteed way for you not to make more money is to keep doing exactly what you're doing right now. And so until the pain is great, the change does not occur. Until the pain is great, the change does not occur. There, until your back is against the wall and you're in a crisis moment, either for your family or your friends or a cause you care about, let that drive you. And the bottom line is this is, a, this is a conversation that you will never look bad in. When you talk to your boss about, look, I love working here. I want to make more money. And I've come up with three strategies to help the business make more money. Your boss will always take that meeting you will never look bad by helping the business do better. And one thing I would just mention, there may be people listening that they might be a teacher, a cop, a firefighter, a pilot. You know, there are certain occupation classes where even if you're the best, if you're the teacher that every parent wants their kid to have, you're the teacher of the year, you can't go to your principal's office, bang on the door and say, look, I want more money. There's a pay range based on seniority, based on experience, all that kind of stuff. So what you're gonna have to look at is the side hustle. 
you, know, you mentioned that third option, this might be your third, fourth, or fifth option, and people ask, how do I start a side hustle? And what I would do is just ask yourself one question. What is the question most people ask you on a day-to-day -day basis to help them solve? Is it, boy, how can I manage students who aren't very good with their behavior? Or how can I open this spreadsheet quicker? Or how can I write an email or whatever, whatever, whatever it may be? Start with where you're adding value right now because that's your focus group. Those are people who know you, like you, trust you, who want to help you. And if you're adding value to them and they're telling you that's the feedback, boy, this really helped me. Now you have a business model you could charge for and grow it organically. So that's how I like to start side hustles is what problem am I, am I solving right now in people's lives? So if you're a teacher, a cop, a firefighter, you could change jobs and make more money elsewhere. But my guess is you're in that job because your heart is there and your passion is there. And I know you're tired at night from serving so many people, but if you want to make more money, if you, if you don't make the change, you're not going to get any any change in your money, you've got to make those changes right now.